Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacob Fry. I'm the mayor of Minneapolis, and you're joined uh, by a huge swath of people representing different sectors in Minneapolis, uh, from council members uh, charged with enacting policy uh, to people with disabilities who are concerned about the general direction of this rideshare ordinance, uh, to people from the airport to businesses to small and local restaurants, all of whom depend on a cornucopia of transportation options, including rideshare, which has Uber and Lyft. You've all been covering the rideshare story now for many weeks, if not months. And so you know that last year that the city council uh, put forward an ordinance that wasn't based in data, but was based in ideology. I vetoed that ordinance. You know that then the city council brought forward a policy that was exactly the same rate that they put forward about six months ago. I vetoed that one again, and that veto was overridden. Uh, and as so many of you also know, that policy was put forward the day before a statewide report came out. I've said it before, and I'll say it a million times. When we enact policy, we should be trusting experts. When we push forward policy, we shouldn't be making it up ourselves, but we should be listening to data and facts. This particular statewide report analyzed 18 million rides. This was a deep market study, one of the most extensive of any done in the entire country. And the policy that we have now that has been moved forward, that is set to be effective on May 1st, did not use that report in coming to the policy that was put forward. And as a mayor of a major city, uh, I deal in the reality business. And the reality is that we have countless people that will be dramatically affected by the exit of Uber and Lyft. I couldn't care less about Uber and Lyft's bottom line. This is not about helping those two companies. This is about helping the people that rely on this important transportation network to get from point A to point B. This is about people with disabilities that can't always jump on public transit to get where they need to go. This is about people who are blind, who have a difficult time uh, getting to the, their job or getting to a doctor's appointment, uh, and it's much easier to navigate if they've got uh, the reliability of a rideshare company that's present. This is about people that go to the airport and come to Minneapolis for a range of a wedding or a convention or a major event or a ball game. This is about all of us. Uh, and importantly, there is a way where we can both dramatically increase the rate of pay for drivers and simultaneously keep Uber and Lyft in our city. For those that are setting up the argument that this policy that has been proposed is essential because we need to give Uber and Lyft drivers a pay increase, they are setting up an argument that is not intellectually honest. Because every single council member and I as the mayor agree that we can increase the pay for drivers. This is doing it without listening to the data itself. This this present policy is doing it without listening to facts. And so the ask here is, is very simple. Uh, I'm urging the city council to move uh, their, to change their policy. I'm urging the city council to change their policy that they have presently put forward to make sure that all parties are engaged. Drivers, riders, and yes, transportation network companies as well. We're urging them to change the policy so that we can keep this important transportation option in our city. Right now, there is a council meeting uh, coming up this Thursday on April 11th, where the council will potentially reconsider the ordinance that has been put into play. Uh, we need to reconsider this ordinance. It doesn't make sense for people throughout our city. And so I have a whole group of really amazing leaders and advocates that are with me here today to tell their story, to share this with you. Uh, and I want to go through uh, several of them. First, we've got a number of, of city council members here that have been doing the really hard work 
to bring this policy into reality. We have our, our council member Andrea Jenkins from the 8th Ward, our council member Latricia Vita from the 4th Ward, council member Lene Palmasano from the 13th Ward, and is that it? All right. <laughs> uh, and I'm really pleased that, that, that you all are here with me. Uh, and I'm also, uh, we've also got with us here today the, the president of the National Federation of the uh, Blind uh, Minnesota Chapter. Their chapter passed a resolution just last month asking for a swift resolution to the issue of dri driver wages because their members rely on rideshare and metro mobility and taxis can't fill that gap in full. Also joining today is the chair of the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Aging, who works closely with seniors every day to ensure that they're able to safely stay in their homes. Without rideshare, she's worried that some of the people she works with will no longer be able to stay in their homes. We've got advocates for people with disabilities who rely on rideshare to get to work uh, wherever that work may be. These are people who cannot use regular route transportation services and cannot take chances on the wide pickup windows that Metro Mobility provides. If they lose their jobs because they cannot get to work, they can also lose their homes. And of course, we've heard from business groups uh, that rely on rideshare services for travel as well, many of whom here are with us here today, including Meet Minneapolis, the Metropolitan Airport Commission, Minneapolis Downtown Council, the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce, and Hospitality MN, to name just a few. I'm deeply concerned about the ability of Minneapolis businesses to thrive if people can't use rideshare to get to them. Not everyone has a car, not everyone can drive, not everyone is in the position to drive. We need to also be thinking about them. But I'm also concerned about the bartenders, the dishwashers, all of the wait staff, late night janitors, anyone that runs an overnight shift, medical professionals who leave work after the bus stops running and have no other option but rideshare to ultimately get them home. So we're going to hear from people from MSP uh, Airport, that some of their leadership about the volume of rideshare pickups that leave their terminals every single day. Uh, we're on the cusp of celebration season and people are going to be coming here for weddings and convention, parties and ball games. And we want to make sure that they're not stranded at the airport, to put it bluntly. And I'm also worried about people, uh, about our city's ability to host these large scale events if we don't have reliable and easy to use access transportation that is known to people not just in Minneapolis but internationally. Uh, in April, Minneapolis is hosting the North Country Regional Volleyball Tournament with an expected 6,000 employees. In May, we have the Clean Power Convention in our city with more than 7,000 participants expected to visit. And did I mention that we've got USA Gymnastics coming as well, expecting 50,000 participants. Some of them will get from the airport to their hotel using public transportation. Some of them will have a friend pick them up. Pick them up. But as I'm sure it is the same with many of you, when you go to another city, one of the options that you look at is rideshare, is Uber and Lyft. And I'm sure you've got that app ready to pull up on your phone. The list is endless. The impact of these companies leaving Minneapolis is detrimental and reaches every corner of our city. And so I want to thank all of the people that are with us here today. I want to thank all of the people that recognize that when we do this policy, we have to do it right. We've got to listen to facts, we've got to listen to data, and we've got to listen to our constituents, not leaving anybody out. That's how good policy is done well. These decisions have consequences, and the council's decision to act without engaging all of these players and stakeholders and without considering this data will reverberate not just across our city, but across the entire region. Uh, so again, thank you so much for everybody that is with us here today. Thank you to this great team of people that have been advocating constantly to share their truth. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to a number of individuals, starting with Angie Whitcomb, the President and CEO of Hospitality Minnesota. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Hospitality Minnesota represents 180,000 employees in the metro area, and 40% of those workers rely on rideshare services to get them to and from their jobs. If rideshare as we know it ceases to exist in Minneapolis on May 1st, it will leave a significant portion of our workforce without affordable, safe, reliable transportation as they commute to and from work at all hours of the day. 
In addition, it will leave business leaders with an even tighter worker shortage than they are already, already facing. Rideshare has provided a well-documented reduction in driving under the influence, serving as a responsible alternative for our guests and our residents. We've all invested time, energy, and resources into revitalizing Minneapolis's tourism economy, attracting large-scale meetings and events to the city, maintaining world-class restaurants, sports, and entertainment offerings, and we cannot afford to actively discourage visitors or events from coming to our region because of transportation limitations or higher market costs, especially at a time when those efforts are starting to pay off. And although we're finally seeing increases in tourism and events, 2023 hotel performance data shows that Minneapolis is still performing well below the top 25 metro market averages. Minneapolis is better than that, and we need to do better. Now we're weeks away from the start of an incredible tourism season. Over the next three months, we're expecting 75,000 visitors and over 175,000 room nights booked in our hotels. These guests need to be able to move about Minneapolis and the Twin Cities easily and safely. But that's not the experience we are about to provide for them. We are concerned with the amount of time that it will take for any new rideshare option to get licensed, background checked, and scaled up to manage the current demand of over 400,000 rides a week. Allowing this departure to happen without reaching a compromise will have devastating effects on the hospitality industry and the employees of those businesses that make this city work. Uber and Lyft will be fine. The local economy and the very workers you're trying to protect won't be. So we are here today, surrounded by many of those employees, to ask the City Council to reconsider this ordinance and find a path forward that works for everyone. Because this ordinance, as written, represents a considerable threat to the economic growth and revitalization of our region. Thank you. And next we have Corb O'Connor, President of National Federation of the Blind. I'm Corb O'Connor, President of the National Federation of the Blind of Minnesota. Um, we are uh, a consumer advocacy organization that's been working in this state for 100 years. And so often we're seen as the consumers of rideshare or of services. And I'm grateful to the mayor and to the leadership of some of our city council members for inviting us not just as consumers, but as participants in the future of transportation in our city. We are looking for the council to reconsider its motion. We support thinking about rideshare in a longer term way. Let's think about it in a sustainable way and let's use data and let's use the lived experience of people with disabilities, including members of the National Federation of the Blind of Minnesota, as we have those discussions. For me, as a, as a blind person, I can get around without, public trans, without uh, Uber and Lyft. I can use public transit to make those things happen. But it's not always the most convenient and it's not always the most reliable. When I have a doctor's appointment for myself at 11 a.m. in Burnsville, and my son has one at 1 p.m. in downtown Minneapolis, that's easy to do with Uber and Lyft. It meant that I didn't have to take an entire day off work for those appointments. It meant my son didn't have to take time off school for the entire day, but he could just take those few hours because I could go to my appointment, swing by his school, come downtown, and take him back to school in a reliable, affordable, and convenient way. As we think about other companies entering the market, we support other rideshare companies coming in. But one thing that we know takes time and effort and energy and skill and expertise and connection with the community is making sure those apps work for people with disabilities. iPhones and Android devices work great with screen readers that take what's on the screen and read it aloud, but only if those apps are built with accessibility in mind. And we have many of our members who use service animals. That has been an ongoing source of discussion with Uber and Lyft. They're aware of the issues. They've committed to training with their drivers. And they're committed to responsible solutions to these problems. Others coming into the market will have a steep learning curve. 
and others coming into the market will need to work with organizations like the National Federation of the Blind of Minnesota to make sure that we get this right. Right now, the city council does, did not get this right. We got it wrong. Let's step back from the cliff and let's make sure that we can have a responsible discussion about a path forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Corb. That was powerful. Uh, and next, I'd like to bring up Jonathan Weinhagen, the president and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Well, thank you, Mayor, and thanks to all of the folks who are here today um, to, to push back against this important issue um, and to have a, a really important conversation. You've heard about the econo economic impact on hospitality workers. That's felt across all industry sectors across this city and this region. You've heard about the forthcoming tourism season. We're talking about tens of thousands of visitors, hundreds of thousands of hotel room nights, all already planned um, as this date is looming for the potential exit of rideshare in Minneapolis. We're all taking calls from trip planners asking us, what should we do? Worse yet, we're hearing from future prospective conventions, corporate site selectors, and others who are taking Minneapolis off their list of places to visit and places to locate. It's not a great look for our city. I want to be clear, the Minneapolis Regional Chamber supports increasing the rate for drivers, supports a minimum wage equivalent. The Minneapolis Regional Chamber also believes the report that came out through the Minnesota Labor and Industry Department that spoke to this, that the mayor talked about earlier. The companies have signaled that they would continue to operate under these basic standards um, from this long-awaited report. We can pay drivers more and keep this critical resource in our city and in our region. It's frustrating to hear that some council members, not those that are here with us today, aren't willing to even take conversations with company executives or other stakeholders uh, to find a path forward. We've heard a lot about alternatives to Uber and Lyft. I want to be clear, we support competition across the marketplace. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to hear from the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, a great partner of ours. We're always looking at expanding the options at the airport. And when Spirit Airlines and JetBlue and Southwest and others come into the marketplace and they add routes, it's a good thing for the Minneapolis airport. It's a good thing for the region. It's a good thing for the consumers and competition. Mm -hmm. And if our major providers like Delta leave, we'd be in a world of hurt. I've been reminding people that these are the partnerships that matter and the partnerships that work. And that's not the spirit of partnership that we've experienced in this conversation about rideshare in our city. It's also important to note that one of the likely new entrants to the market that we're hearing about increasingly has been operating in Washington, D.C. without a license. Late last year, D.C. leaders sent out advisory, advisories cautioning residents and visitors from using the platform because it didn't have the regulatory oversight around driver background checks, uh, safety, insurance, and so many other things that we've come to expect from this critical resource in our city. We remain hopeful and are going to continue to work with the city council um, as we head towards that May 1st date to ensure that rideshare companies find a solution the city council moves forward. In the meantime, there are 22 days, 11 hours, and a handful of minutes until we could realize a reality in this city and across this region without rideshare. So today, the chamber, in partnership with others, is launching Rideshare Reality MSP. The mayor talked about that reality conversation with a call to action to council members and a plan of tracking the economic impact that this would cause beginning May 1st. Um, so thank you, Mayor. Thanks to all of you. Uh, we'll look forward to the work continued. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for doing the work to actually track that data. I think that'll make a big difference. Uh, next up, we've got Chad Lecvi, the Vice President of Operations and Management at uh, the Metropolitan Airports Commission. Chad, thanks for being here. Good afternoon. Um, as the mayor stated, my name is Chad Lecfi. I am the vice president of management and operations for the Metropolitan Airports Commission, which is the owner and operator of MSP International Airport. I appreciate the invitation from Mayor Fry to be here today to share information about the role rideshare companies play in getting people to and from our airport. Put simply, Uber and Lyft are two of the most popular options for people wanting to get to and from MSP with 2.8 million trips in 2023. In 2023, we had a daily average of 2,474 Uber pickups and 1,406 Lyft pickups at MSP. This far exceeds taxi trips with an average of 649 per day and shuttle and limo trips, both under 
200 per day on average. Uber and Lyft reported that 17%, or 240,744 of their trips originating at MSP terminated in the city of Minneapolis. Headed the opposite direction, Uber reported that 26%, or 226,671 of their total trips to MSP originated in the fine city of Minneapolis. And Lyft reported that 34%, or 176,984 of their trips to MSP started in this city. Our most recent data shows that 6,950 permitted Uber drivers and 5,361 permitted Lyft drivers currently operate at MSP Airport. Of those rideshare drivers, 3,477 are permitted by both Uber and Lyft. In comparison, there are 244 taxis permitted to operate at MSP, only five of which are also permitted in the city of Minneapolis. Given the key role rideshare plays in getting travelers to and from MSP, we are closely following developments here in Minneapolis. And we are mindful of the potential impact and disruption for travelers. Taxis, light rail, buses, and other ground transportation options will continue to be available going forward. We also recognize that Lyft has indicated it will continue to provide services in the metro outside of Minneapolis. MSP Airport is located outside of Minneapolis, and that means Lyft would remain an option for travelers so long as the other end of the trip is outside the city of Minneapolis. However, given the sheer number of people who prefer to use rideshare service to get to and from the airport, and the sizable portion of those trips invol involving locations within Minneapolis, it's clear that if Uber and Lyft stop serving the city of Minneapolis, there's going to be an impact for MSP travelers. If no agreement is reached to retain service through Uber and Lyft, we should expect challenges and disruptions for airport customers. Disruptions would most likely affect people coming to MSP from other parts of the U.S. or from other countries trying to get into Minneapolis for business or recreation. We are concerned that people arriving to MSP from faraway locations may not be aware of the disruption in rideshare services. This may, they, excuse me, they may arrive May 1st expecting to use Uber or Lyft as they have for many years, then suddenly find they need to, they need to scramble to find other options. With this in mind, we will be stepping up efforts, efforts in the week to come to communicate with travelers about full range of ground transportation options. We are also hopeful that a solution can be found that works for drivers, their companies, and our communities to keep rideshare services available for the millions of residents and visitors who fly to and from MSP every year. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Uh, and next we've got Angelique Kingsbury, the chair of the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Aging. Hello again, excuse me, my name is Anjali Kingsbury. I am the chair of the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Aging, and I am also the director of the Magnet Senior Program at Westminster Presbyterian Church, where it is my honor to work with older adults and elders every single day. Um, I wouldn't say boots on the ground, there may be some canes and some walkers and some comfortable <laughs> shoes, you know, but we're here and we're together, and uh, our mission for our program is to reduce social isolation because if there's anything that we've learned from the height of COVID restrictions is that social isolation can be deadly. It quietly takes the lives of people every day and the elderly are especially at risk of isolation and loneliness. Transportation networks are one way that elders can participate in society and keep their social muscles from atrophying. And so what I'm hearing in the conversation, of course, is a lot of fear because 
none of the seniors I know really want to rely on public transportation. They don't want to stand out in, in the heat, in the cold, and walk over ice and climb snow banks and be in an unsafe environment sometimes. They want to be safe. They want their freedom. They want their independence. And losing ride share is going to take that away from them. And it does not take long, let me tell you, as you age, it doesn't take that long to be alone where you start to experience a decline. I'm not being dramatic when I say literally one week of just sitting down and being inactive can really impact you physically, mentally, emotionally. Our elders need to have reliable transportation. They need to have access to ride share that's something that is affordable so that they can be out participating in community because they are the people that tend our community gardens. They're the ones that are still picking up the trash. They are the ones that are doing the babysitting and often taking lifts and Ubers to their children's house so they can babysit their grandchildren. Not everybody has access to a car. So it's very, very important that the elder voice be considered in this conversation. And I'm just really surprised that the city council or some council members were not willing just to wait one day, one day to have access to this information that would give them, uh, would aid them in giving a more well thought plan. It just doesn't make sense to me. So that's what I, I guess I have to say. We need to consider our elders in this situation and not take them for granted. Because let me tell you what, if you're not seeing them out active, it's possible that they're sitting home alone. And you know where they go next after they sit home alone? They go into a hospital bed in the nursing home. And you know what a lot of nursing homes are like? They're like prisons. Raise your hand if you've been to a nursing home lately. Raise your hand if you would like your elder to not be able to go where they need to go or to be in unsafe conditions trying to get to where they need to go. Raise your hand or consider if you would want that extra data that came out through that report before making a, a, such a very important decision for our city, our residents, the metro area, the state, all eyes are on Minneapolis right now in what it is that we're doing. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Angelique. Uh, and next is Paul Ohm, the general manager of Internet Continental Hotel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have had such wonderful speakers here today that have touched on almost every facet of our lives. Being the general manager of the Intercontinental MSP Airport, we touch on so many of the things that have been brought up here today. Well, we welcome over 30,000 group room nights. Those are the conventioneers that come to the city that depend on Uber and Lyft on evenings that they have off to go out into the city and enjoy what we have to offer. Another aspect of our business is the business traveler. Those people that come in from around the country and around the world that call on companies in our city. They depend on Uber and Lyft to get there. We do a great deal of social work, meaning social galas, weddings, bat mitzvahs, celebrations of life, whatever it might be. Those people come to the hotel using Uber and Lyft. We do galas where we do fundraising for the many important charities in the city. People use Uber and Lyft. This touches every facet of everybody's lives. I depend on Uber and Lyft for my team members, my colleagues, my employees to get to work every day so that they can service all of the people coming into the city and create that wonderful experience that so many leave saying, what is that Minnesota nice? And it brings them back to spend more money in our city. I am fearful, very fearful, 
that once meeting planners find out that there is no ride share in this city, they are going to look to move their business to the Indianapolises and the Columbuses and other cities around the country because it's going to be too difficult and it's going to become too expensive to move people through this city. We're coming into the spring. The Twins just had their home opener. It's going to be, it's going to be theater and art season. All the restaurants down here are going to be opening up their patios. Soon it will be time for Vikings football. All of this is going to be impacted. And I bring that up because there are many visitors that come to this city to watch our professional sporting teams that are from outside the city. I have regular guests that stay with me from Santa Barbara, California to come and watch their beloved Vikings. How do they get down here? They take Uber and Lyft. So I ask the council to please take a serious look at what you've done, seriously reconsider, and let's look at the data and support the mayor and what he is trying to do for our city because we cannot afford to lose another cent in sales tax and property tax. We just cannot. We must revert this course of action. So thank you very much and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and then finally, we have Nikki Villavicencio. Uh, M from MCD Chair for Council on Disability. Thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nikki Villavicencio. I use she, her, sha pronouns. I am the Chair of the Minnesota Council on Disability and a member of the Maplewood City Council. MCD is a state agency that works toward a barrier-free Minnesota where every person with a disability has full access to all aspects of life. We are here today to express the importance of transportation network companies for folks with disabilities in Minnesota. However, we also want to ensure they are inclusive for all people with disabilities, including those who use wheelchairs. As a professional and a wheelchair user, I am also an avid transit user. Although the transit system is accessible, it doesn't accommodate my busy professional schedule. My ability to get around is my independence. When we don't include all people in the policies, it means some of us don't belong. The Americans with Disabilities Act requires taxis to have wheelchair accessible vehicles, but TNCs who have mostly replaced taxis do not have these requirements. This is just another example of policies being passed without recognizing the impact on disability community. Uber and Lyft have never pro provided fully accessible options in Minnesota, but they do in several other states. For example, in Washington, D.C., I can get a wheelchair-accessible Uber in eight minutes. As a professional in multiple roles, in addition to being in the council chair, I'm also a member of the Maplewood City Council, and I work full-time at Advocating Change Together. I often have several meetings in a day. Our current public transit system makes it t a tight schedule in different locations virtually impossible to accomplish. If TNCs were more accessible for mobility devices, people with disabilities could live fully inclusive lives at work and at play. MCD advises the public and private sectors to meet obligations and eliminate barriers, which is why we are here today. Uber and Lyft have said that they care about people with disabilities, but we are here to advise them to care about all disabilities, including wheelchair users. We are tired of being excluded. We believe that any city or state resolution to the TNC issue in, the Minnesota, in Minnesota must include accessibility requirements. Thank you, and I will stay for any questions or comments. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, and with that, we'll open it to questions. So the question was, there are some people that seem to think that Uber and Lyft are bluffing, and what is my response? Uh, well, first of all, they have already begun taking steps to exit on May 1st. 
Uh, Uber has closed down one of their offices. There's a number of leased vehicles uh, that are no longer able to be leased uh, through other uh, contracting services. Uh, and additionally, if they're not actually going to leave on May 1st, uh, barring a change in the ordinance, then they've got one of the worst marketing strategies I've ever heard in my life. Um, they will be seen as liars. Uh, and I'll be one of the first people out there saying that you, you lied. Uh, you know, we, you know, regardless of what Uber and Lyft is or is not going to do, we should be listening to independent research. We should be looking at the data. The data from the state report analyzes 18 million rides. It is inclusive of both greater Minnesota as well as the metro. That is the kind of data that we should be using in creating policy, and that is the data that was ignored, both the first time the ordinance was passed and also the second time. Mayor, there are nine companies coming to town. I know that, that they came up. Many people mentioned that. I'm trying to understand why it is that they're not good enough in, in your and the speakers behind you's eyes. Because you've got some that are providing them at volume. It's a licensing issue. We've got, a, we've got some time here. Um, you know, like, why is that? Why are they not an option? Why are they not a solution to this? They are an option. If they're able to get set up, they could be a solution. But again, we have to be operating in reality. Uh, if we can get more competition in the rideshare market, there's not a single person out there that will oppose it. Uh, but the reality is, is that these companies have to get insurance, have to run compliance, need background checks for drivers, inspection of vehicles. They need to get licensure through the city, all within a very short period of time. And that's disregarding all of the capital that needs to get raised to actually see a significant company get off the ground and running. Uh, and so the reality is, is that this doesn't get set up in this short period of time, period. And, you know, if, if we're talking about large-scale companies that have scaled an idea that aren't able to meet the rate that the council has proposed in a large-scale manner, it's going to be even harder for these smaller businesses that are operating out of somebody's basement. That's a joke. I don't know that they're operating out of somebody's basement. My jokes have failed lately. Uh, uh, but that are operating without significant backing to actually get up and running. And there's one company, by the way, that I've heard uh, some council members champion that is talking about not being subject to any of this regulation at all. If we're for the regulation to set the wage, and obviously we're for the regulation to keep people safe, why would we allow some company just to get around that same regulation entirely? It doesn't make sense. But they couldn't get established. I mean, Austin taught us that you know, there were nonprofits that were all, you know, you give them time, you give them a runway, and they will be serving people at volume. And then maybe they could be serving people at volume by the time so again, uh, I disagree with the premise. We are willing to give these other companies a chance. Come to Minneapolis. We'd love to have you. Uh, the premise, though, is not operating in reality, and it's magical thinking. Uh, they're not going to get off the ground at the rates that we need them to in any immediate uh, uh, point in time. Uh, not to mention... As far as I know, there's only one that has signed up to get licensure at this point. Maybe there's two. There's only one. Yeah. We'll, we'll get you the information on that. Uh, we're only aware of one that has begun to go through the licensure process, and they don't have insurance yet. That's at least my understanding as of now. Mayor, you're urging the council to reconsider the ordinance. Are you urging them to reconsider these changes? I am. Uh, the rate. Uh, so there isn't a state rate, as far as I'm aware yet, that is being negotiated at the state level. Uh, what I'm encouraging everyone to do is look at the state's report. And I'll say something else. The stated goal of many council members 
was to achieve a minimum wage plus expenses. As the state report points out, a minimum wage plus expenses like the entire cost of a car and the entire cost of a cell phone can be achieved at 89 cents per mile and 49 cents per minute. And you can go up above that figure and get additional benefits beyond that. Uh, but again, the figure that the state put forward to achieve the minimum wage plus expenses was 89 cents. The figure that passed the city council was $1.40. It's not close. I haven't heard anything about that. The reason that the May 1st deadline was set wasn't arbitrary. It was because that was the effective date of the ordinance. Are you working with the state legislature on any type of compromise? Do you have any update on that front? I, I don't have a full update from the state legislature. We are working with both uh, the legislature, with the governor's office, and with the Department of Labor and Industry, and specifically Commissioner Blissenbach. Um, and the, the, again, the main point that rings true across all is that we've got a state report. We should not have passed policy from the get-go a day before the state report was issued. And now, after the fact, we should be listening to the state report. Everybody okay? I need to get some help here. Go ahead. I've, I've put forward a series of different pay rates, uh, all of which uh, come in the range that was authored by the state report. Um, we need to consider the goal that we're discussing. In this case, again, it's minimum wage plus expenses. We, we also need to consider the precedent that's being set here, which should not go overlooked entirely. Uh, and I'll just ask the rhetorical question of, are we now planning on setting a minimum wage for every industry that comes forward? Are we setting a new wage uh, with expenses for all tech workers, uh, for workers in the fast food industry, et cetera? Uh, you know, we have to be looking at the consequences of what we're doing here. And again, there is a way to do this right. There is a way to significantly bump the wages for drivers and simultaneously keep this important service in our city. A wage bump doesn't do any good if you don't have a job anymore. Two more questions. There was mention of uh, rideshare reality MSP. Is that something that's supported by all the organizations here today, or is that a specific organization? I believe it's a specific organization that has uh, made a bit of an announcement today. I'll pass it off to Jonathan to fully explain. Yeah, rideshare reality MSP powered by the Minneapolis Chamber and the Downtown Council. Um, really with an idea of a call to action to our council members, as well as a plan forward. Again, uh, you know, we measure all sorts of things with regards to the economy. Uh, you heard a lot of those today, the great numbers around the visitors that we bring here, the hotel room nights, uh, the economic impact of our sports and events and conventions. We also want to ground this reality in data. We want to understand what is the impact um, in as real of time as we can. Uh, so that's what we're pre preparing for as we head towards that May 1st date. Thank you. One more question. Um, Oops. Well, thanks for that question, and uh, here you go, Mayor, never mind. Uh, I got you, I got you. Here we go, here we go. You know, I think that, thank you. I think that, you know, we have some new information. And I think it is incumbent on elected folks to really be mindful of the data. And if we 
made a mistake, then we need to be willing to to change with new information. And so um, that's my position, and I'm just hoping that my colleagues will be uh, willing to take that new information and and recognize that as well. Uh, I think it has been stated earlier, uh, it's probably the most um, contact that I've had about a specific issue um, in several years. So, yeah, it's been a lot. Phone calls, text messages, emails, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I feel like there was, I made a decision based on the information I had in front of me, and then now we have new information. And I will note that uh, Council Member Andrea Jenkins uh, voted for a delay until after the information on the state report was issued. That was part of her initial vote. You guys have anything to do that? Great. Thank you, everybody.